welcome to this study of battle tactics for Rule of Ways 2, part four, thinking about the bigger strategic picture. Plus, I've added in some bonus thoughts, mainly derived from the excellent level of comments that I've had in the previous three parts of this series, and I've been thinking about the expansion that's currently under development for Rule of Ways 2, and what that might possibly mean for our battle tactics going forward. As you'll be familiar if you've seen the earlier versions, I divided up this series into some ideas about how to be a bit more cunning in your play, how to maneuver your ship or division, how to maneuver your entire fleet, and now we're going to look at some tactics that relate to the bigger picture. Doesn't necessarily mean they're bigger thoughts, but they are at this top level. First off, is merchant ships. So a number of your scenarios will include merchant ships bobbing around, leaving aside defending a convoy, where of course you have to defend the convoy, otherwise you will lose a significant number of victory points. But particularly when the enemy comes raiding against you, there will be individual merchant ships sailing, and they need protecting, primarily through steering the enemy away from bumping into them, because if they do bump into them, they'll sink them, and if they sink them, you'll lose victory points. Not a huge number, but why gift the enemy any at all? In similar vein, meet your objectives. So a number of your missions, particularly raids by you against the enemy, will have some set objectives, typically sink so many ships, or bombard uh, a particular land objective. There's a good argument, because you're being sent to the enemy's coast, near their bases, near their ships, that what you need to do is do the job, finish the job, and then leave. Don't expose your ships to unnecessary risk. This obviously becomes much, much more serious once air power is around and you are exposing yourself to attack from land-based aircraft. Thirdly, rescue survivors. Again, these are free victory points just waiting there to be harvested. In my experience, I've never had a destroyer or a cruiser that's been detached to pick up survivors get into trouble as a consequence. Obviously, you need to watch that. You don't want your detached ship to suddenly be overwhelmed by your enemy and sunk. But as I say, I've, I've never seen that happen so far. Lastly, in my original series, is this one, which actually is properly strategic, which is, is the entire battle itself worth fighting? You get two bites at this apple. Bite number one is... At the beginning, when you are offered the battle, you are offered the opportunity to decline. How many times you just automatically hit accept? I decline destroyer engagements because, well, frankly, they can be a bit tedious. Destroyers are hard to hit with guns. Destroyers are hard to hit with torpedoes. You end up pirouetting around the place in some sort of weird destroyer ballet that gets nowhere. So... If I have a significant victory point lead, I, I may well decline those kinds of battles. However, if you are in a position of weakness and you look at where this battle is and you look at the type of battle involved, you can ask yourself, do I really want to fight this? You might lose 700 or 1,000 victory points if you decline the battle. But you could lose tens of thousands of victory points if your battleships are sent to the bottom of the ocean. Fleet in being comes to mind as a phrase. Very popular amongst navies that are inferior. Your second bite is when you're actually in the battle, assuming you've accepted it. Then there's a whole complicated force balance kind of question once you're aware of who your enemy is. Now, the battle generator is pretty good at offering you battles that are largely balanced, but not always. And if you are severely outnumbered, or if qualitatively 
it's not worth fighting, then make the decision early on to just leave the battlefield. Yes, the, the enemy may have other ideas and come following you, but it gives you a different quality of battle, and you don't have to expose yourself unnecessarily. The things I think about is how strong are we? How strong are they? What time of day it is? How much daylight do I have remaining? It's unlikely that you will sink an armoured ship in an hour. Even within two hours, that's a really tight amount of time, as Jellicoe found at Jutland when his battle fleet got engaged at quarter past six in the evening. So how much daylight is remaining? How much night time, if you're at night, do you have to go through before dawn? And indeed, do you wish to fight a nighttime battle with all the risks involved? What's the weather like? And is the weather reducing any of your advantages? So is the visibility reduced? Is the maximum speed reduced? Are air operations compromised? So, you know, if you have carriers with you, but they can't fly their planes, they are at huge risk. If your fleet is designed to emphasize speed so that you can normally decide whether to engage or disengage, something I often do in my designs, and the maximum speed is uh, brought down so that everyone is the same, then again, one of my crucial advantages is uh, negated and why would I fight a battle when it's not going to offer me the maximum opportunities to exploit what I've carefully designed into my ships? Is the mission achievable? Now, again, the battle generator is pretty good at creating missions that you can achieve, but it's still a question well worth asking. And a more important one is if you are currently blockading your enemy, can you risk any of your battleships or battlecruisers being sunk if that then compromised your blockade? On the other hand, if you were being blockaded, is this an opportunity to sink some of those enemy capital ships and balance up the scale between their blockade strength and your blockade strength? Are you vulnerable to land-based uh, air, or indeed can you get support from land-based air? And then finally, what type of battle is this? I'll go into that in a moment. Um, the bigger the battle, the bigger the rewards, the bigger the risk. So I'm not suggesting that you habitually decline battles or having accepted a battle, you then run away, but it's absolutely worth thinking about when the battle position becomes clearer. Bonuses. So first thing is types of battle. There are a lot of different types of battle. I've hand recorded, I think it was 242 battles from 11 games that I've played. And this is the ratio of battles that I've found. This is the actual number. So as you can see, Cruiser actions are by far the most popular type of battle, whereas bombardment, enemy coastal bombardments are comparatively rare, or invasion battles comparatively rare. Now, this isn't definitive. Part of this is caused by your play style. I have become less keen on invasions because I'm less keen on colonies because they give comparatively little in terms of money and can cost comparatively a large amount because of foreign station requirements. I also tend not to have a strong raiding force. The number of uh, interceptions where my raiders are being intercepted is comparatively low. So out of this uh, number, about 24, I think about 10 of them were my raiders being intercepted. The bigger number was me intercepting enemy raiders. I tend to put my light cruisers onto trade protection. Equally important to notice is the size of the battle. So you get fleet engagements. They always include capital ships, usually most of your fleet. Large battles, these usually contain capital ships 
but a limited number of them. So a typical profile here is your battle cruisers and some of your armored cruisers off uh, on a mission. Medium battles, primarily cruisers, can be a large number of destroyers, but mainly cruisers. Uh, small battles tend obviously to be destroyers, and what I've called single battles, these are interceptions of raiders. This is how often these things occur. And you, as you can see, large battles and large battles and fleet predominate. But if you look over here, cruiser battles, cruiser actions, and cruiser engagements are the single largest type of battle. Now, I've analyzed this for different reasons, and I'll be using this in a video I'm going to make on gunnery. For here, it's just to be aware of the sheer diversity of battles that you could be fighting, and whether you want to fight that. Next up is... <laughs> Thank you, German language. This is... Thank you, uh, Google Translate. Kefetzverdung-dong-ish. Uh, the battle turn away, the simultaneous turn of your battle fleet, all turning simultaneously, so they're not getting to one point and turning in succession. The Germans mastered this and used it no less than five times during Jutland. Twice, importantly, when the T of Admiral Scheer was crossed by Jellicoe and they needed to get away quickly, but even just as a standard manoeuvre, so Admiral Hipper in his scouting group, used it twice just to get into proper position in front of the battle fleet just before the events in this uh, map are shown. Shear then used it to escape this first crossing of the T. He then used it out of contact with Jellico to get his fleet pointing in the right direction, because obviously this reverses, the head becomes uh, the rear and the rear becomes the head, so he reversed it again. And then he had to do it for a third time when he bashed into Jellicoe in a second crossing of the T later on. You can find this maneuver not in the division, but up here in the order of battle, if you click on one of these main forces, so here you've got the Soviet main force, and down here here you've got the Soviet scout force. In the Soviet main force, if you right click on this, you get up this dialog box that includes how fatigued your force is, whether you have set the black flag for uh, torpedo uh, attacks and changing your lead division so that you can move your flagship. And this one, the battle turn away. Unfortunately, it's in a slightly obscure place, it would be better if this was on the division dialogue box for your flagship, but there you have it. At the right time, it's a really, really useful tactic. Next is thinking about this whole thing all together. I've created this series to think about battle tactics, things that you can do or things that you need to be aware of when you're actually in a battle. But it doesn't stand alone. And I would encourage you to try and think comprehensively about integrating this and how you want to play with the three other things that you can do. So you've got doctrinal choices that you can make. You've got your research priorities on what you want to emphasize. And crucially, you've got your what I call design tactics. How do you configure your ship designs to fight the way that you want? And I'll be producing and hopefully co-producing a series on this in the future. And that's, I think, is all I wanted to say about battle tactics. Just wanted to have a little muse about the ironclads to missile cruisers expansion that is coming. Reading through the clues of what's going to be available, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of these elements. This, of course, is speculation. So first of all, ironclads themselves. So what are ironclads? Well, they're battleships clad with iron, obviously. They actually do start to be armoured with steel towards the end of the ironclad era, but the name kind of stuck. And then the name, it, it didn't have like a hard end, so there wasn't like a, a dreadnought ship that suddenly marked a step change that was pre-dreadnoughts, these are now dreadnoughts. It kind of fell out of fashion as ships evolved. Pre-dreadnought battleships 
came about in the early 90s, the early 1890s. So the Royal Sovereign is arguably the first pre-dreadnought class for the Royal Navy, and the Majestic that followed it is kind of the classic, the epitome of a pre-dreadnought. Also, armoured cruisers evolved. So armoured cruisers did not exist in the ironclad era, mainly. Yes, there were some quite small ones, sort of 5,000 tonne uh, armoured cruisers, but the 12,000 tonne, 21 knot armoured cruiser that we know didn't really evolve pretty much until uh, the turn of the century. The Americans brought out sort of an intermediate size one, the New York, in 1893. It was about 8,000 tonnes and a little bit faster. But the full thing, like the Cressets and the Fust Bismarck and the Jean d'Arc, uh, are only coming out at the start of Rule the Waves now. As for ironclads, well, the range is going to close right down. I'm going to estimate at about 2,000 yards. So for pre-dreadnoughts, you'd often fight at 5,000 yards. That's not happening. Ramming may well be a lot more common. And many of your ironclads may have armoured rams as part of their design. Ramming, if we start in 1890, had pretty much fallen out of favour, but those rams are still around in the water. Your approach to actually fighting is going to be longer because the range is shorter. And then once you're in range, your margin of manoeuvring is going to be quite narrow because it's only going to take four minutes to close the range from 2,000 down to ramming. Uh, this is assuming the ironclads sail at about 16 knots. And then lastly, you might see quite a few experimental types uh, and types with a lot of tactical limitations. So here's Colossus in Edinburgh, 1882, a perfectly straightforward ironclad. And as you can see, they only have broadside main armament. They also have restricted arcs of fire from their six inch guns. It has a very different format to speak of, no fore or aft firepower. Obviously the game may tweak this in various ways, but that's what I'm expecting to see from ironclads. We're also being promised expanded aircraft carrier operations. So we're going to see night air operations in lake carriers and jet aircraft in lake carriers and helicopters. And we're going to see AVs, seaplane tenders, become helicopter carriers with potentially a, a lot more utility. And they're looking to start carrier battles before the dawn so that you have time to prepare your strike packages and you have time to prepare your uh, scouting. Thirdly, we are going to see expanded missile tactics. Now, in many ways, missiles are a bit like torpedoes, obviously faster and longer range, but they are volley weapons. And there's always a tension with volley weapons. Use them or lose them. The platform the warship, the submarine, is always vulnerable to being sunk. And if it's sunk, you lose the lot. So, you know, it's not like in gunnery where you can lose a turret and your gunnery performance is gradually degraded. So we're going to see guided missile cruisers, possibly, I expect, missile boats like the old Komar class here, uh, guided missile submarines for certain, and AVs now as helicopter carriers with the helicopters carrying light anti-ship missiles. We're also going to see expanded submarine operations. This will certainly include long-range submarines, being added to the mix, and anti-ship missile submarines in the later game. I don't know whether they are thinking of substantially expanding the submarine, the submarine game more than that to give us some sort of operational control. That would be nice. And then finally, there will be AI wars. One of my own personal bugbear is that if you go to war, everyone gets an enormous boost to their defense spending. Yet only you and your enemy are the ones that incur any costs. All the countries at peace just get a giant fat bonus to their naval budgets. Whether that will be fixed or not, I don't know. But certainly the opportunity is for the AIs to have wars between themselves. Whether that means 
we will have expanded diplomatic opportunities to join in? I don't know, but I think this is potentially a very exciting opportunity. If you've enjoyed this series, here's my personal recommendations of some stuff that you might want to look at. If you only bought one book to increase your understanding of fleet tactics, then Fleet Tactics and Naval Operations by Wayne P. Hughes is an absolute must. It's a diamond of a book. It's quite expensive now, unfortunately. It's in its third edition. I have a, a first edition and I'm I'm actually thinking of buying a later edition because it's quite substantially upgraded since the first edition, which was in the 80s. It will be a book unlike any of your other books on naval warfare and naval history. Lots and lots of great books on the technology, lots and lots of books on the operations, very, very few books dissecting how battles were actually fought. And Hughes takes you from Trafalgar up into the Missile Age and brings out some of the commonalities, such as torpedoes and missiles are volley weapons and have similar kinds of tactics on a different scale, and does some great dissections, both of things like Jutland and of American carrier battles in the Pacific in World War II. Can't recommend it highly enough. Next up, if you're interested in the whole gunnery thing, then these two books are absolutely worth a look. Norman Friedman, of course, we all be familiar with, is a great naval technologist. His naval firepower goes through and does a great job analyzing the technology uh, and the problems around uh, gunnery. He has one flaw, which is that he, he seems to be great chums with a professor called John Suminder. If you're not aware of historiography, the history of histories, of World War I naval history, it all started with this chap over here, Arthur Marder, his fantastic five volumes from Dreadnought to Scarpa Flow, published in the 60s, still absolutely worth getting, uh, and in reprint, uh, these nice paperbacks, very reasonably priced. Arthur Marder dominated World War I naval history for a generation or two. And Suminder came along, and another historian, uh, Nicholas Lambert, and they did a major revision. And they came out with all sorts of weird theories about what was in Fisher's mind. Their work has been comprehensively demolished by a set of post-revisionist historians. Andrew Lambert, not to be confused with Nicholas, and John Brooks here, and a host of others. Happy to talk about it in the comments if you're interested. And they've brought us into a kind of a, a halfway house where we acknowledge um, some of the things that Arthur Marder left on the, uh, on the cutting room floor and some of the things that have been revealed as historians have got creative finding new sources. One of the problems is that Marder got chummy with British naval archivists and he saw records in the 30s, 40s, and 50s that no one else can see because tragically the Navy, the Royal Navy, destroyed 90% or 95% of its archive in a tidying up exercise. God, nutters. So modern day Neil historians have gone into the private papers and letters of admirals and done a huge amounts of work around that. So that's fascinating. And an example of this is John Brooks's Dreadnought Gunnery in the Battle of Jutland, A Question of Fire Control. This is a more recent work than Friedman's. Friedman is a technologist, primarily. John Brooks really is also a, uh, an engineer, but he was really, really centrally interested in the operational consequences of this. So John Brooks has a couple of really detailed chapters on the various fire control systems offered to the Royal Navy by Arthur Pollan and by Frederick Dreyer. And I'm not an engineer and they were a bit too much for me, but I still totally recommend this book because his salvo by salvo analysis of Jutland and particularly his deconstruction of David Beatty the Admiral in charge of the British Battlecruiser Forces, operational failings is just immense and fascinating. And there you have it. My thoughts on battle tactics, 
I hope they've been interesting for you. They've certainly improved my play and made me fight battles much more thoughtfully. Any questions, please leave them in the comments. Happy to answer. Please give it a like just so that you tell YouTube's algorithms that other Rule of Wades fans will find this interesting too. Next up, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into gunnery. I know I've said a bit about gunnery in these tactics, but I've been going into a salvo by salvo analysis of what happens when you are shooting away. And wow, I've learned so much about what's going on almost under the hood. You can find it, it's in the logs, but it takes a little bit of finding. So hopefully I'll be able to bring that up in a way that you've got some straightforward stuff to make your shooting better. Thanks for watching and stay safe.